everyone. Well, today is a different kind of day because I'm thinking of life and death and life, really. And our special guest today has been to heaven and he's been to hell. And I'm asking the question, what is fear anyway? So, we're going to have that conversation. Sit back, you're going to enjoy this one because who knows where it'll go. It might, it'll go deep. We know that for sure. So, let's just have the conversation. Hello, Tom. How are you today? I'm good, good, good. Thanks. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Oh, I forgot to introduce myself if you don't know. I'm Karina and this is Break for Your Fine Freedom. <laughs> Sorry about that, Tom. <laughs> so, we've spoken before about you reaching heaven, right, um, with your near-death experience. Um, and, and we spoke, in, and then what happened when you got back is you were drawn into hell, right, by being in your, um, by being drawn into your psychiatric hospital, right? I'm asking you now, what is fear anyway? Um, having experienced both extremes, Hmm. This time I will remember your question. What is fear anyway? <laughs> we, we've, we've all we've all experienced. We're all humans. We've all experienced the extreme. Um, the heaven thing—that's where we all come from. I think when people get addicted to heroin or cocaine or opioids um, or anything, I guess that's a taste of heaven for them, and they're trying to get back there as quickly as they can. Um, I could totally get that. Um, that is a tiny taste of where we came from. Um, is it really, or is it Satan? Okay. It's it's a good question. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, to, to, I love you know when when Christians and people talk of God and Satan, I think <laughs> Satan not part of God. You know, you think is he really outside God's control? Has God given him unlimited, unfettered control? And can God not reel him in any time? Does God not have absolute control over Satan? Is everything not God? Because if it's not, then we should be really afraid all the time. Who's going to win this Satan or God? We have really good reason to be afraid. And our egos and our culture, Western culture, says this could go any way at all. The wrong guy could win the next election. Uh, we could have global warming even before grandchildren are born. Um, yeah, awful things could happen because, because we're in a chaotic and different universe. Because there's God and there are other forces. And that's a very, very, very... Judeo-Christian, or so-called Judeo-Christian, Judeo-Islamic, ancient, those religions point to view that there's God, there's nature, and there's humans, three separate, totally separate things. So when I think Satan, I think fear. Eckhart Tolle talks about psychological fear as opposed to what other fear? When you see a grizzly bear in front of you, I mean, is that psychological fear or is the native animal primordial fear. It seems very reasonable to be terrified of the grizzly, but you're only terrified because you think you might die and have a painful death. To me, all fear is Satan. It's it's resistance to what already is, based on our past experiences on who protect the future. This guy's gonna claw me to death. Um it's just calling it resistance is just another word. It's, yes. it's, it's the feeling. This part of it, we had an earlier chat this morning, Karina, and I kept being reminded that we all have, Carl Jung said we are ancient beings, maybe we're an infinite past. Our species yes. has taken apparently a long, long time to evolve here from when we stood up, from when we started making fires, from when we started thinking our thoughts. Um, and I think there's a tremendous momentum of since since we stopped being animals and living in the moment, there's a predator, I get away. You know, a bird is looking around all the time, sees, sees a, a predator, just gets up and runs away or dies or whatever. Uh, as human beings, we tend to think and think and over. Yes. And um, yes. as human beings, we're thinking, that, that, sh that shouldn't have happened, and I better take steps to prevent it happening again. Um, and, and we live in a state of constant fear. The animals, I think, are in a state of constant surveillance, maybe, rather than terror or panic or fear. Whereas we imagine so many possible avenues of things going wrong that we tend to live modern humans in a state of constant fear and anxiety. And, and I think that's 
party inherited momentum of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of years of, of human human fear. Um, so I, I think we've all come from heaven. That's our home, I believe. When people take shortcuts back, try to do drugs or any other addictions, it's just give me a taste of where I came from, so I'll remember why I'm here again. It will strengthen me. I deserve, I deserve the hit of this, the chocolate cake, the heroin, the cocaine, whatever my reward is, just to, to strengthen me and remind me of why I'm here. What is my motivation again? We all have our fallbacks, our goals. Yes. But, yes. Um, but ultimately, I think ultimately we can be so healing for one another that that just by our sheer presence we can remind one another that we have all the absolute access to everything within and um, that the heaven is certainly within us and that the hells are imaginary and outside us um, I don't think anyone as any human being has not experienced hells and hells and hells. And um and and we will do a lot to avoid those. Um fear. Fear is this this idea things aren't as as they should be. Um isn't that what fear is? Feeling that this is not the way it should be right now. Yes. Yes, but also I think we create a lot of those fears within ourselves um, because we we always think, well, for me, let me talk about myself. It's like um, I want to do this project, for example, just as I want to do this project, but what if um, I fail or what if I succeed? What if I'm like, it, it blows up and it's so great and then what? And a lot of times it's about that. So maybe in some way we are afraid of our light, as um, I think Mandela said, or uh, so many um, spiritual teachers say. And maybe that's exactly what we're afraid of. So why do, um, and I'm not assuming anything, I'm just talking. Um, mm -hmm. Why do people, why do you become addicted to heroin or drugs or alcohol or marijuana or cake or sugar or whatever it is? Because you're trying to, 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 to deaden that, that, that fire within you because what if we are become too bright and we outshine everyone else? What if, they, what will happen then? Marion Williamson's famous um, lines, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate, our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure because our light and our darkness which most frightens us, quoted by Mandela. She ends by saying that when we let our own light shine, we unconsciously liberate others to shine their light. And um, I'm slightly obsessed with King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. You know, if there were no struggle with the evil knights out there, what would they have to do in Camelot? Sit around eating and drinking all day? You know? <laughs> Quest, the quest would be over. Uh, I like to think that Arthur and his knights are sleeping in a cave and that they're sleeping within all of us and we're waking up and thinking, yeah, but when, when, we've, when we've finished the quest, that's it. No job security, so let's, let's keep struggling. They say of the Irish, and I'm Irish, that we're only happy when we're in hell. When we're in hell, things can get infinitely better, you know? Yes, lot, yes, yes. The, the, the cliche yes. of the depressed middle-aged housewife often is she's the perfect husband, the perfect family, the perfect house, perfect car, perfect everything. And she's terribly depressed, so she suddenly realized it's me, it's not my circumstances. Yes. They say, and they say yes. suicide rates drop during times of war and struggle because people are struggling. You know, when this war is over, things get a whole lot better. But it seems that we're innately happy only when we're struggling, you know, more and more and more. And we're afraid of reaching the end. But, but, <laughs> um, um, in How to Train Your Dragon, the first one, the, when the struggle with the dragons, the fears, the negativity was over, they were still able to make a second movie, strangely enough. At the end of The Lord of the Rings, Gandalf and Frodo sail away to Nirvana, and we don't see another, it's only a trilogy, we don't see the next one. But I think we're 
hardwired to be afraid at the end of the struggle, it seems. We, we, we do nothing to get our teeth into. But then the ego, I think, really, our conditioned mind, our unobserved mind says, if you achieve all that and you're disappointed, what then? Boy. <laughs> so put off the achievements so you still have something to report to. I knew a lady who was very ill with the fibromyalgia and she tried all kinds of human high-tech specialists in Europe. And um, she knew there was a healer guy out there and she was saving him to last because deep, deep, deep down she knew the other stuff isn't going to work and if he fails, it's all over. Um, so, yes. so burning our matches, big, yeah. Um, so so we're, we're kind of, the ego is a friend at the end of struggle. And, um, and then, then occasionally you look at some being who seems to, it could be Taylor Swift, does, does, she works incredibly hard, I've no doubt, like Dolly Parton. She doesn't seem to be in struggling. The enthusiasm and the joy and the gift of giving seems to keep her going and going. I hope she never burns out. And I hope she will continue to be a example for a lot of people and inspire people. Um, Desmond Tutu was full of joy and laughter and loving, and he gave and gave. He may have been an archbishop in his religion, very different man, but he gave and gave and gave, and, and the enthusiasm kept him going. He never got the end of the giving. Um, some enlightened masters like Eckhart Tolle seem to dwell in peace. They seem to have got there beyond struggle, and they're very happy to go on saving and saving and saving humanity mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. having great fun doing that. So when we look to some of these examples, the ego might say, yeah, but, but, but really, there's no end to how much we can give if we let ourselves, isn't there? Yes, yes. And, and I think um, in, in some weird way, and, I, and I'm thinking about myself as well, it was always like, what if I get this, then what? Exactly what you were saying. But we don't realize that once we get there, there's a bigger mountain to climb or there's something else that comes up whatever always. it is right there's always. always that so you always get bigger and bigger and you can and you can just um feel that fire and the fire just burns brighter and brighter yes. and brighter because yes. we just find more and more things to do and we and yes. with that we touch more and more people yes which maybe that's exactly what it is about right to to not influence people, just to touch people and to show, like you were saying, that it is possible, that there is light, we've all got light. And once you find it, we can all, and now this sounds very kumbaya-ish, okay? But we can all raise each other up. So by holding our, our, holding our hands out, we can help, help each other up and see that there is possibility once we achieve greatness because there's always more greatness to find, right? And, and by keeping ourselves small, we're actually doing the world a disservice. One of the most fascinating things about Joan of Arc, who was burned at the stake, we spoke about that earlier this morning off, um, was that after she'd liberated France from the English, she wanted to go home and help her mom with the housework. That was, that was <laughs> actually, at 19, that's how she, according to Mark Twain, I believe it's true. Um, that, that's intriguing. Um, yes. Chesterton, Chesterton said about her that she chose her path and went down it like a thunderbolt. She did until she didn't. At the end, she, she, she struggled at the end with Joan at 19, for any mistake. But um, what is about, about about letting our light shine? What is it about Joan? Um, so I, I, I've, I've forgotten it went off on a tangent. Um, about you being small. The, challenge, the challenges to the, yeah, sorry, go. Where so what, you, so what I was saying is that by keeping ourselves small and keeping our light within ourselves yes. and being afraid yes. to shine yes. that light, yes. 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 We're, doing every, we're doing ourselves a disservice and the world yes. a disservice. Yes, I, I got, the, what I was thinking was that the healer guy whom this lady went to eventually had, had healed a veterinary colleague of fibromyalgia by magic, seemingly by magic, okay. Um, he was the most extraordinary individual. And when I finally met him in person, I, he said, do you want to come in for a minute? I said, sure. I was there just to pay him. And um, I said, sure. And he showed me into a room and he said, this is where I do my work. And I said, is that what you call it? And I was, I was, I was being cynical and, and being a little bit snarky, nasty, because <laughs> intuitively I felt if he's really what I think he is, he's going to roll with this. I can't offend him. You know. So I was doing the horrible thing that humans do 
you know, not pulling the wings off, but sticking the needles in to say, are you really? It's so nice, you know, people do that. So I said, is that what you call it? So, you know, I said, and then I said, kind of nice to you. I said, Eamon was, you know, I said, Eamon, if you really heal people like, like, he said that, he insists I don't heal people, I help people heal themselves. I said, okay. I said, if you can really heal people of all these things, how, how come, how come there aren't 10,000 people lined up outside your window? And he said, and he smiled at me, he said, it doesn't work like that. He said, you know, and I chatted with him and I had the most extraordinary conversation afterwards as a totally different person. And I think I've probably told you at least once I called him up afterwards and said, how do you do it? And he said, I just listen, you know, listen. And then I let the lightning of God go through me. And as he said that, I felt the lightning. And I thought, anybody could do that. Even I could do that. And we all can. So, so while we think about numbers naturally, you know, um, we think I want to save the world and so many people with my infinite power, I need to save all this and then go on and save all the other planets and galaxies and then all the other cosmoses, really. But 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 the other game is when you're with one person, you can, you can, there's, there's actually no limit to what you can give that person. And that's what Eamon told on the phone that time. He said, and then I left the, talking to one person and left it. You can give infinitely that one person. And maybe that one person will go off and be a Taylor Swift or an Nelson Mandela or a Desmond Tutu or an Eckhart Tolle. And, and maybe you have to ignite them and you never know what they never know or the world never know. Who cares? But, who, cares? But, but who cares? Who cares? One galaxy, a million galaxies, same hit, same thrill, whatever. But uh, yes. but, but the, when you can tap, when you realize that it's, it's just about that one person that you're with right now, <laughs> I mean, the, the fun of that and that that in youth, you think you must conquer the world and all do all this stuff. And as you get older, you realize you get so much, 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 much more out of so much less. And you realize, well, this, this payback could be infinite because I think it's so much more so less. The, uh, James Harris had a beautiful story about a miner who drank gallons a week. And when he was paralyzed from lying in bed, he had one bottle of, on a Sunday, of bed, one little bottle of beer. And he said he got much, 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 much more joy and satisfaction out of that one little bottle of beer than he used from the gallons. You know? And he realized, oh, what a game. You can get an infinitude out of the conversation of one person and you could be a rock star and come off stage and say, where's my next hit, you know? Yes, yes. And, and, and often those poor rock stars, they need the heroin or cocaine because, because unless they have this half a million people shouting at them, they're not feeling it and they feel bereft and, and depleted. God love them. Yes. So so do yes. we, we, we contend with giving our absolute all to one person or one animal or one tree or whatever we're doing. We can, the joy of that, just finding that we can give everything. Oh and be restored by giving it, not to keep it. Yes, yes, that's exactly. And um, I think as well, you, you speak a lot about ecotole. It's about being in this moment. So right now, this nothing else exists except this moment and this conversation. So nothing else exists except you um, in this conversation. Um, and, and, and that's what makes it so beautiful, really, because like I've said often, is you walk, we, 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 we join together, like um, we started conversing before the show. Um, and once the show's over, I mean, because we spoke a bit before, and then we have the conversation, once it's over, I'm not the same person that I was coming into this conversation. And hopefully neither are you, which means that you, we both go out and we still influence people without influencing them. It's just by the energy of it all. Uh, and that's beautiful on its own, right? And, and I think that's about realizing that we are all one anyway and this conversation has a ripple effect on a whole lot of other people in different planets, different galaxies, different timelines. So, so yes, yes. One, one of Eckhart Tolle's most beautiful nuggets is he says that um, at a certain point you come to teach not by what you're saying or doing or writing or talking, but by your sheer being present. Yes, so, yes. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. So those monks in monasteries, Trappist monks and nuns and stuff of all religions praying away, they're, they are changing the world just by being there even if nobody ever meets them, talks them. But not only that, but um, but the really funny story, I think Oprah Winfrey tells it, 
one of the, I guess, whatever you feel about Oprah, I think she's one of the most enlightened beings to grace this planet. Thank goodness for Oprah. But she, um, she, one of the most influential books she ever read was the New Earth and the Power of Now. She got inside her bed and she said that most of the lines in it were highlights. <laughs> Every line. <laughs> so, so anyway, when she was plotting, apparently, um, a series with Eckhart Tolle about it, the New Earth was going to be four or some shows. Six months out, she was panicking, Oprah panicking a bit with her lady producer about this, that, and the other detail. And she'd call up Eckhart and he'd say, Can you feel your hands? She's like, What? Can you feel your hands? <laughs> she tells that story. So, Can you feel your hands? <laughs> I mean, it's such a beautiful story that, that the, and when I lie awake at night, anxious, sometimes I think I should feel my hands now. I don't have time to do that. Now I should breathe. No, I don't have time for breathing. <laughs> don't, the, the, you know, the Zen Judaism thing, the Zen, it's very funny to Google it, Zen Judaism. Breathe in, breathe out. <laughs> yes, breathe yes. In, forget that and attain enlightenment for the last year of your days. But um, but it, when he says feel your hands, of course he means uh, you know he, he, one little meditation trick. He says close your eyes. Uh, where are your hands? When you're when you're wondering where they are, you're, you're automatically feeling feeling where they are, and you're feeling the energy in them. And as soon as your attention, your consciousness has gone to where any part of your body is, it's gone out of your language center, your thinking mind, and 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 by byproduct and side effect of that is 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 your calm right down and that, that is the trick about any breathing technique is when you're focused on your breathing as well and he says if you can't feel your body immediately or your hands or all your body try and feel the breath going in and out and so on so he, he other people say breathe like this and breathe like that and meditate and all. but he i like him because he breaks down exactly for me baby steps what's happening when you're feeling your hands when you're thinking about your breath a lot of your attention has left your thoughtful mind. Yes, yes. The thoughts are what persecute you and make you anxious. Yes. So, so I said, oh, all right, now I get it. Now yes. I'm finished. Um, yes. So, so, but the thing about Oprah was that the, the show, I'm sure, was wonderful. And I've seen some of her interviews, like with Kate Nutt and mine, one interview. But, but the little, just the little story, Eckhart, oh, what about this, that, now? can you feel your hands? <laughs> We've oh, we got a show to put on. Yeah, can you feel your hands? <laughs> she, she saw the <laughs> it's one woman. <laughs> I love it. It's a, it's it's and it's again it's about any anxiety, like you're feeling anxious, just step away, step out, step outside, take a walk, just change the energy. No, I can't um, because because if, if I leave all these worries, what'll happen to the people? I've got to look after all these, I've got to caretake them. All yes. day long. Yes. I got it. We all got it. Look after worries. What'll happen if I walk away from them? Haven't free things. freedom. <laughs> And we were talking a lot, now you, you were talking, first of all, I'd, um, as you were talking, I was thinking about that Zen quote, what, does, what is it? Um, carry wood, chop water, before enlightenment, carry wood, chop water, after enlightenment, carry wood, chop water. So it's just a different perspective, you'll just carry the wood and chop, carry the, carry the water, chop the wood, I s with more mindfulness maybe, and enjoy the process after enlightenment. So it doesn't really matter. We're still living here right. in this life. That, that goes so deep with me. In my case, before whatever passed, I had moments of enlightenment and I lost it, you know, so no boast there. I just, I just, I saw what it was. But anyway, before my, I was a veterinary surgeon, if you don't mind, right? But after my enlightenment, I did very literally do a lot of chopping wood and of carrying water. And, and funny enough, I was working on an ashram one day and I didn't realize that the, um, my friends, Chains are overheated, and, uh, and some of the logs began to smoke. So he threw water on them and went away. And the next day, I came back to the ashram. I discovered we had nearly burned down the entire ashram because some of those logs burst into fire overnight and nearly burned the place down. Oh wow! And, and the very, 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 very sweet, enlightened, forgiving head of the ashram. I hope I don't get in trouble by saying this. He told us um, he, he still tolerated us being there, which was amazing forgiveness. He could have been a Pontius Pilate and said, he, and he said, um, there's a faucet over there, a tap over there. Could you please have some buckets of water ready in case? And, and he went away and he prayed for us. But but boy, was it a question of chop wood and carry water. Wow. 
that man was so forgiving. Oh my goodness! And he had, he had a lot of the community was saying, "Get rid of those idiots," you know. But but he stuck with us. I thought he's in the position of Pontius Pilate. He's got a whole lot of people telling him, "Do the reasonable thing," you know, safeguard. And he's and he whether he called the Pontius Pilate or not, he said, you "No, know, I'll, I'll, I'll do the most loving thing." It was incredible what he did for us. But I the love irony, it. The I irony, love and, it. And, and the also irony is that the previous day I'd been praying, let your fire fall and cast out all my fears. That prayer had been in my head and shit. Wow. <laughs> Some people. I, I, I don't think I could have found it in my heart or my courage to forgive someone, the jackass who'd done something like that from my action, but that man found it. What a guy. That is amazing, and, and I guess that is enlightenment um, because you can see it for what it is, right? And uh, what I, as, as you were saying about praying about the fire, um, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, that you that you created, right? Or could we say it was be careful again what you wish for? Because that time you really got it. It was uh, uh, the universe is very literal, right? Uh, so not when you it's not stupid. So why would it be? Why would it misunderstand us? It's uh, because like it, it it does because it's literal. That's what they say. Like that's what. And if you think about, um, if I think about the things that I've wished for, if you say like. Um, I don't want to be poor, for example, right? I don't want to be poor. The universe doesn't hear negatives, so it just hears I want to be poor. So it's like, okay, so here, yeah, you can have poverty. So you were asking for, for the universe to, 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 to um, burn out your, your demons or whatever it is, so you got a fire. I got a hell of an example from that head of the ashram in, in I believe. And in, the forgiveness. In, oh my goodness, I, I, I Googled again yesterday, Victor Hugo, Les Miserables, I don't think I've seen the entire movie. I don't know what the book said. Um, Hugo was translated saying that there was no more powerful force than an idea whose time has come. The French was actually a bit different to um, with you. Yes. You can, you can withstand armies, you can't an idea, well, you withstand ideas. But, um, Hugo in Les Miserables, it begins, I think, with the bishop of all, with the Monseigneur, um, because he's the he's the linchpin of the whole movie, I think. By his loving forgiveness of Jean Vanjan, he changes the life, and Jean Vanjan changes the world, I think, one person. And he changed it by, by when the peace brought him back with the stolen silver. He looked and he said, why didn't you take all the other stuff I gave you as well? And he said, he didn't steal it, I gave it to him. In a moment, of, of, of like the guy in the ashram, he just, one man's life and self-esteem and everything is more important than my welfare just a human being uh, extraordinary but um but there's the universe the law of attraction people say that it's kind of stupid and literally it looks like that um you know the joke about the 13 year old 16 year old girl who went into the doctor with a cough and he said uh, please lift off your shirt and he started listening and he said big breaths and she did this and she said, yes, and I'm only 15, you know that joke. <laughs> but when I, I, early on in my career, I wanted to be, I decided I'd be a vet and then a writer. And I decided I'd get lots of experiences by traveling around and doing local work in different places, being a peripatetic vet. So I kind of said to the universe, I want to be a peripatetic vet and then a writer. And the universe, with my thick lips, the universe seemed to hear, I want to be a very pathetic vet, or a very <laughs> pathetic vet. And I was a very, I think I was a very pathetic vet really when I judge myself partially I think I was but it's like the universe is a jokester but I don't think it, it misunderstands us because the universe understands us better than we do it well maybe it is when we're ready to see things right to perceive things because it, it, if you a lot of times things are happening around us all the time right um People are living their lives and things are seen. But you only see things when you're ready to see things. Okay, let, 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 now I'm talking in riddles. Yes. Um, yes, yes. Let, me, let me think of an example. Um, and, and you see it from the way you are. Okay, so if I'm feeling like really bad about myself today, um, 
when I go out, everybody seems sad and, and, and everything I see is, seems like it's derogatory against me. Whereas if, if I look at it, if, if I go, if I come back home, and, and we're just doing this on repeat, I come back home and I decide, wow, you know what, I'm beautiful today, I'm great, I'm happy, I'm, I'm a beautiful person, whatever it is. And I go out and I live the, and I go and I walk the same path. So it's the same day, right? Um, I'll see different things, and then I might see the opportunities that were there yesterday, but I didn't see them because I was feeling down on myself. So maybe that's what it's all about. So the universe is telling you, give, showing you all these things all the time, but you're just not seeing them because of your own stuff, your own stuff, you know, the way you're feeling about yourself at that time. Maybe, does that make sense? Or totally. does it bring... Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's very like we're, we're running on automatic with all these feelings and by default, it could be from our race and our history, it could be negative stuff um, and or whatever mood comes over us, we just go with the mood, we let it envelop us. And then yes, one day, yes. hey, hang on, I, I'm in a bad mood, but but I, I remember there's actually a pause button and there's a rewind button and there's another play button. There, there are all these buttons here if I want to say, no, it's like the breathing, I don't have time for that now. I'll do it another time. But 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 eventually we're forced, it's so painful, it's, I got to find that button. There is a button. <laughs> There's a yes, button to stop yes, that you can get yes. out of it. And there is even a, self, a sense of humor button. You say, humor, no, no, no time for humor now. It's humor, stupid, stupid. It's not, I, I need to. <laughs> but, but, but eventually we know there's no argument about finding our sense of humor again, regardless, because our sense of humor is our highest level of consciousness. For me yes, anyway. yes, and, yes. And when you're saying, no, there's nothing funny about this, this never will be humor, it's just inappropriate, uh, that, that, that we, we've been overtaken by it. But, but certainly, if you're a lot of people like to think that they're more empathetic and more energy sensitive than others and more but but if we get into a really bad mood we're all we look at anything we look at popping we cry we look at anything that's stressing on tv and, and we don't realize that we assume that the world out there objective universe is um is there all the time and when we're in a bad humor we think it's a terribly gloomy place and it all ends in death and heartache and um then another day we're in much better humor and um, it seems jolly and light and then eventually i think eventually we see a pattern that it seems as though it's the lens through which we look at it and a lot of people say it is the lens but yes. then an even more disturbing thought hits us am i crazy are they figments of my imagination or could i be crazy and they're not figments of my imagination or could there be parallel universes? Or could I be the almighty, like everybody else, manifesting this? And so on. And, and every thinker has come on that. You, everyone has dwelt on that. Um, and you, you bear it when he said, when you come to a road, it, and when he said, if this world is perfect, it wouldn't be. He's, he's got there. Yogi Berry was very, very profound in his paradoxes. And, um, I think synchronicities often remind us that everything really is the way it's meant to be. When we get one synchronicity, and Jung said it too, not just one, but one upon another, upon another, upon another, it becomes so overwhelming. I think it's God of the universe saying, yeah, 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 things are designed, you know. And you think, in spite of or because of my thoughts and feelings, so we're actually, if you can grasp for a moment, that you are the universe, that, that your unhappy thoughts are God experiencing those unhappy thoughts. And your pleasant thoughts and feelings is also God and that universe consciousness. And that at a certain point in evolution, you can actually say, I'm not liking this mood or these thoughts. I am not my thoughts, I can stop them and change them and change the narrative it's not just supposed to change the lens, but changing, changing everything. Yes, yes. And, and that is so mind blowing. We often say, oh, I just can't, just can't take any more of that. Yes. But, but eventually, we're, by, by pain and suffering, I think we're driven to think, if I can change it, 
for me and for others. Yes, yes, yes. And, and we have that, and, and if we realize that we have the choice um, and that we, we can make the decision, so we can decide um, whether we're going to be happy or sad, right? And I know that sounds flippant. Some, sometimes, some, sometimes the momentum is so huge, it's, we, we, we're just on, we, we can we really cannot, I, I just, the grief is so overwhelming. But, but yes. I, the other, I, yes. I can't, I can't yes. control it. I don't know if you yes. I can't. Sometimes it's so overwhelming, I just can't. Um, but but, well, but I, the day will come, hopefully, when I can. So I go ahead, maybe you can. Well, maybe, maybe if we step, step out of it for a moment and say, how am I, who am I in this situation? What am I feeling in the situation? Who, how do I reflect back the situation? Um, and, and see yourself as the center of the situation and how it's affecting you and how you're affecting it. So you're looking at mirrors and then journal it. Because a lot of times um, I find myself overwhelmed with like emotions, or whatever it is, grief. A lot of times it's grief. Um, because, you know, like, maybe I'm missing my son, you know, because he's far away, or whatever it is. I'll just use that for an example. But I have to look at it for what it is for me, and then realize that at the end of the day, I'm giving meaning to everything. Um, because does anything really have meaning outside of my life, except the meaning I'm giving it, really? So I can say, you know what, I'm really sad because my son is in Ireland and I'm here and we're not together and whatever it is. Or I can say, wow, you know what, I'm, I'm really lucky because I am. I'm really lucky to be here. I'm living in paradise, right? I can find the, the, the good within the situation. I can find the gratitude. I can say, wow, I've got, I've got friends around me. I've got people who love me. I, I live in a beautiful place. Look at these beautiful trees. I know it sounds random. I can go to the beach at any time. I'm not far away. And all these things and suddenly, everything looks different and it just changes the way I'm seeing things and I can see things better for that, with that um, choice that I'm making. And of course, you know, like if you're in, 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 deep, in deep depression, um, it's harder to get out. But, and that's maybe a time when you need to ask for that, um, that rope and maybe just for someone to throw down a rope of, of something, of, of, you know, maybe you can find blessings in your life somewhere and work off that. That is so powerful. Um, for moments I managed to leave my own many responses aside and actually listen to you. And when I did, When I did, funnily enough, the understanding, as, as happens, the understanding got so deep. And an awful lot of people knock new age kind of stuff, tree huggers, manifesting stuff. It's all totally narcissistic, self-centered, navel gazing, me, 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 me generation entitled, Southern California, psh, you know, get, there's a world out there, help people, you know, looking at yourself, therapy and navel gazing, and obsession stuff. But, 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 but. My understanding, and I think yours, is that when a somber mood overwhelms us, and sometimes we realize that came out of nowhere, it wasn't triggered, and it's not because I'm depleted or tired. When a somber mood or grief overwhelms us for no reason, and we immediately find reasons for the grief, of course, but if we pause them on, we think, actually, the mood came first, and now I'm looking for reasons to justify it. Yes. When, when we realize that, that we realize that this work of finding the joy and the gratitude, that's not just about Karina or me. That's not just self-obsession. That is changing universes of inherited stuff. It's changing the entire world. And people who, who, who dismiss that as going through your own stuff, there's a world out there to help, they totally don't get it that any more than they get the fact that there are Trappist Cistercian monks and nuns and Buddhist monks and Hindu nuns and monks all over the world praying and praying and praying and changing the world just by chanting Om or whatever they're doing, changing the entire universe just by changing themselves. And yes. when Gandhi said, yes. even change you wish to yes. see, if you don't totally change yourself, God knows how many universes you don't change. Um, so, so when people dismiss new age self-obsession and stuff, and my thoughts and my mood and stuff, they absolutely, I think, don't get that 
a lot of our grief and our anxiety and our existential angst is passed on from these generations, countless generations of human suffering in our race, in our sex as women persecuted. So, and that when we're dealing with that, really, really, really dealing with that, it's like we're finally turning in that beautiful movie, How to Train Your Dragon, and looking all that stuff in the eye and saying, I see you. I see yes. you. Yes. I understand yes. you. Ubuntu. Yes. I get you. I, we inter are as good and I see it. And when I work on this, I'm working on my father and my grandfather and yes. his grandfather. And, and that's huge work. And it's not just about me, it's about the entire universe within me. And when I've worked on that, I can go out and just by my sheer presence, I might go down the road like uh, whoever, Sidney Poitier in that beautiful movie, uh, To Serve With Love. And he goes down through the market and you can see him lighting up the entire market by his, his Sydney yes. Poitier. Yes. But yes. Uh, we, just just by being there, or I can hide myself in a little hermit's cave like Julian of Norwich, and from that cave, I can just light up the entire universe without ever interacting with anyone, just by changing me. Yes, that's exactly, and that's exactly what it is. We have to change ourselves. So it's not about, I mean, you can take it for whatever you want, okay? Some people take it as self-obsession. It's not about self-obsession. Again, it's about... He, by healing yourself, you're healing the future as well. Um, because you see things differently. If I think about um, with me and my coaching, it was, it's always been like, Tom, 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 I can see your problems. Okay, I can see your problems. I can heal you. I can heal you. Let me heal you. Let me heal you. And you're going to go like, no, go away. You're scaring me. Whereas I was coming from a good place, but it wasn't because it was a a, a, a place of of neediness, a place of having to, by helping you somehow, I can help myself. Does that make, even make sense? So it was a, yes, coming yes, from yes, a yes. place of, of lack. Yes, yes, yes. Whereas now, with 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 working um, with working with myself, and you see things from a different angle, and you realize that. It's only by loving yourself and realizing the power within you and facing the dragon again, facing your own dragons, that you can allow people to heal on the, at their own speed. And when they, when if Tom's ready to 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 to, to engage with me or to that we work together, we work together. But it's Tom who'll come to me and say, you know what, I'm ready now. It's not me pushing myself on you. It's you coming to me going, okay, we can do this. It's time. And it's the same with these, with these um, podcast episodes. There's a lot of people that come to me and say, oh, you know what, I just want to find this. I want to find my light. I, I, I'm scared and whatever. And I'll say to them, this is a perfect platform. This is a perfect platform to share yourself, to share who you are, to give yourself courage to... to to shine your light and a lot of people um, I, I offer them that and a lot of people ghost me they don't after I've offered them that they disappear and before I'd go back and say hey are you interested do this let's do it I can help you and and it just scares people because they're not ready and a lot of people say things because they feel like they have to say things but only once you're ready to to shine your light or you're ready to heal yourself for the want of a better word. Will you come together and again, will the synchronicities come together? And it's a lot like um, relationships, like romantic relationships, right? I believe, and we spoke about this before um, before the show, if you mean to be together, you are together. Now, sounds very synchro like, like um, very romanticized, but it's true. If you think about, um, if you really want to be with someone and you're not with someone, it's not the right time. And maybe you'll meet in a few years later, or maybe you won't. But you have to allow yourself that, you've got to give yourself that acceptance of self, that it's okay. It's okay not to heal the world and not to push yourself on other people. Wow, that was a long story for one little thing, but I hope you got the gist. I did. And um, and um, again, my, automatically when you're speaking, I'm thinking of going off on tangents of the response, and, and and the wonderful thing is, I say, no, 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 just all those, and just leave it there. And the one thing, two things, as you're speaking, I can't remember. One is Howard Schubert. You did a great interview with him. Everybody does a great interview with Howard Schubert. 
and all the interviews are slightly different. He mixes it up. And he's such an extraordinary presence. He would like to change the world of medicine, but in the meantime, when he's with one person, whether it's you on your podcast or a patient who comes into him, he says <clears throat> he sees the person for maybe an hour or two. But you know, Howard, you know, if the person wants to sit with him and you're out for six hours, he's not going to say, clear it off, your time is up. Yes, yes, you know? that's exactly. <laughs> he's not going to sit there forever with one person because he knows that when he's with one person, not of them, he knows that he's worked so much on himself, Howard Schubiner. He's such, he might be the humblest guy on the internet. You can see it in him. He's worked so much on himself. He's such an extraordinary being that, that when he sits down with people and they pour out their heart, he jokes kind of that he's a faith healer. He's a total faith healer, even if he's a professor of medicine, pediatrics and everything. When people pour out their heart to him, they heal themselves. Yes. <laughs> he's yes. He doesn't have to say a word. He doesn't have to reassure them that, that, that their MRIs or their backs are meaningless. There's no such, he, he, he does do that. But when, they, when it's relevant, or that there's no cause for their tinnitus or their fibromyalgia, no physical cause or the migraines. But, but, but he, when they pour out their hearts, when he listens to them, to heal themselves. Holy cow. And, 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 and because, because given a choice between this one person and healing all of medicine, Howard says, well, you know, the person is here, give, give him my all. Because that's his attitude. Yes. As yes. a side byproduct, he actually is changing all physical medicine because, because that's who he is, because he said, uh, just, just, just give this person everything. You know he does that with everybody. He yes. Is. In the street, in the gym, in the everywhere. He just, he just, and, and, and he's so, you can see him, his eyes. You know he's got all this wonderful technical knowledge, but you know that more than that, his sheer presence. <laughs> and of course, the, the process of accumulating all that training and work to get that knowledge has actually created that presence too. Yes, yes, yes. So, and the other little thing while you were speaking was, I have to say, you know, during our last podcast together, um, I told you that I, my daughter once had looked up to the sky and said, Tom, look, look, she was seven. And I said, what is it, Catherine? They've no religious education, our kids. And said, it's God. And I looked up and I couldn't see, there were some clouds I couldn't see any place. And uh, I said, I'll ask her again if she remembers what she saw that day, but I don't think she'll remember it. So mm -hmm. she's uh, 21 recently. So I, after I bought that, I asked Catherine, remember that day? And she, I said, remember, no, she didn't remember. But as I asked her, Karina, <laughs> as I asked Catherine, and she's paying attention to me, and I've been wondering for months, what did she see? As I asked her, I realized, <laughs> stupid idiot. <laughs> she saw the kingdom of the heavens. <laughs> Jesus' whole analogy. He spoke of the kingdom of the heavens, the skies, the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of the Father as one thing. So the Father and God and the skies, formless <laughs> consciousness, the heavens, and one thing. I get it. <laughs> but so is all the stuff in the sky, the clouds and the invisible bacteria, viruses and tardigrades and all the stuff, everything, the rain, the, the manna and the leaves, everything that comes out of the sky. I mean, what's not God? But there she was, maybe, I don't know what Catherine, the child saw seven, but <laughs> what did you see? It's, it's like all these people with Jesus. I think Jesus healed countless people, just healed them physically. Thanks, the leprosy's gone. But they didn't realize they didn't realize they, they weren't didn't become enlightened by the healing and they didn't understand what he's really was all about the metanoia the change of consciousness and the people writing the books didn't get it and, and nobody got it so so they said uh, up, up in heaven up there there's a guy with a beard kind of a man you know god is up there up up there somewhere outside the galaxy you know yes. and, and like me with all my enlightenment about too so it's so funny, but, but the breakthrough was that, I guess, when Jesus healed all these people miraculously, as he did, like people with fibromyalgia, like Howard Schubiner heals them miraculously, through the sheer, intense, compassionate, loving, empathetic presence that he brings to them, they pour out their hearts to him. And, and they heal themselves. And they did that yes. with Jesus, no doubt. Yes. And, and some of them say, oh, he's a great doctor, and I really like but and some of them gain enlightenment from Howard Schubiner, I guess, to some degree, and some of them don't. But but I'm guessing that in Jesus' time, people didn't get the enlightenment. They didn't understand what he was about at all. And maybe that's 
No, the thing, yes, because um, there's that scene, there's a scene, there's some part of, I mean, I don't, I'm not very, I don't know, but there's a scene where Jesus um, heals, heals, I think he's a leper, or not he's a leper, maybe he's a, a disabled person, and he's trying to get into into the lake, Bethesda's lake or something. Yes. And, and of course, there's so many people there, and nobody's letting him in, and he's complaining. He's like, I want to be healed, I want to be healed, and no one's letting me into this lake. It's not fair. Yes. And I think Jesus turns around and says, um, it's, you don't have to be in the lake. Just come here and you'll be healed. And I think we need to realize that as well um, as, as, as ourselves. We need to realize our power within. And I think that's what he was, he was trying to say, that what I'm seeing is that we, we look outside looking for things to, 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 to hold on to, to, to be healed. Whereas we don't realize that if we sit down for one moment and just breathe in and, and, and realize how, who we are and the love within ourselves, that we can heal ourselves. But we need to be at that moment point, and maybe we do need the 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 the, the um, shubhanas of the world to hold our hands at that point. But maybe we don't. One of the things I like about shubhana is he talks about being angry with people, being slighted. Do you think? Do you not realize all the power you have? And how could how how, how could anybody slight? How could you be? You know, with your gift, how could you? And, and, and then the, when you mentioned the leper, apparently some leper came to Jesus and Jesus uh, asked for healing or Jesus said, you want to be healed? And he said, if you can or if it's possible. According to the Gospel of Mark, Jesus suddenly became angry. Yeah, I like to believe that. There's a big learned discussion, I mentioned this to you before, about whether they translate as Jesus became compassionate. You know, it was moved. But, but uh, I like to believe he came in and he said, possible, all things are possible to one who believes. You know, how many... You know, so I believe that Jesus, for all his power, lost the rag too, repeatedly. Um, just, is it, what am I not getting across to you guys? You know, so it, it's okay. It's, it's, I find it very reassuring to meet the most extraordinary, powerful, healing people and suddenly see their Peter player, their weaknesses, and their blind spots. And like, wow, they're human too. And um, and that, that means that for all my humanity, you know, wow, it's within all. And, and even while the residues of our stupidity and our ego remain there, we can still achieve. I didn't have to spend forever working off the last vestiges of our ego, and now I'm ready to go walk on water and heal the world. And you can do it in between ego attacks. Right, right. And maybe we don't want to heal the world and walk on water today. And maybe we just want to sit at the beach and enjoy life and experience life or... or I don't know, go skydiving, whatever we want to do, right? And, and, and maybe we should be living life at that moment anyway. It's funny how the sense of urgency comes on us. We're overwhelmed. You, you might see I mean, there was violence in the world yesterday, an, an attack on a former president. And, and, that's, and, and somebody killed, by the way. At least one person killed. Yes, that I heard that, yes. Yeah, I mean, and, and there's stuff going on in Gaza, Sudan, Ukraine, there's stuff going on absolutely everywhere. And no doubt in distant galaxies there is too. But somehow we get the grace to say, you know, all that stuff's going on and I need to give myself a little bit of regeneration and restoration um, now before I get back into the fray again. Mm -hmm. I sometimes think that, that one proof that this is the best of all possible worlds is that we really, really only can give our best when we're at our best. Yes. If we could. yes. M Mother Teresa teaches me that lesson, kind of. She was so worn out, you know. and if she weren't so worn out, maybe she'd have raised more funds. But, um, but, uh, and what I get from Jesus' healing ministry too is that, like most healers, he neglected himself terribly, horribly. He got terribly burnt out of him, very, very depleted, and uh, and that explains his little outbursts and shows of impatience and things, his frustrations of him being fully human and fully divine, like all of us. Um, and giving more than he had to give at times, mm -hmm. he, he became defeated. And um, we all do, and, and, and we wouldn't be worth much unless we did, as our children talks about the best kind of people, the people who care too much and give too much. But eventually, having given too much and cared too much, as it were, and neglected yourself too much, you realize to help people the most and to give them the best example. 
I do need somehow to try and find some balance yes. of looking out for myself, whatever, whatever that balance is. Yes. Eventually, eventually we all come back. And I, I really do find that is one of the greatest messages of Jesus. At the end, he said, you think I came to bring peace and joy and love? And it seems, it seems, I came to bring fire and the sword, brother against brother. It seems I was trying to bring love, but obviously people didn't get it, and it's causing. He, he had a little glimpse, I think, of the 2,000 years of, of fighting that was often, often wars are ideological in nature, religious in nature. What did he say? I'm a Christian, you're a Muslim, whatever. Um, so many wars have been ideologically based. You, you talked about hell and heaven, and one Jew. The difference between religious and spiritual people is that religious people, um, spiritual people don't kill each other. And the other, the other joke is that um, religious people are afraid of hell and spiritual people have been there. Um, <laughs> I like best what Tolle Tol says, of course, uh, being spiritual is nothing about what you believe, as literally yes. nothing about what you believe, but all about your state of consciousness, which, is, which, which with me is a very good Anyway, sorry, sorry the, 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 the point of all that to sum it up was. I'm lost. I am defeated. You see, we had an hour chat before this started. <laughs> no. It probably saved you from a whole lot more words. But I am feeling a bit defeated. <laughs> but but after this, I, I, every every chat I have with you, Karina, Gion Zoli, is that how you pronounce it? Gion Zoli, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, they're they're um, incredibly transformative in the hugest possible way. Thank you. Thank you for what you do with your presence. We, um, I sometimes think we, we may not understand each other quite literally, but but the, the like you read, the presence you bring, the, you, you, you come with the intention obviously of giving you, you know, the podcast and the audience in the back, of, but you, you always come to the table just wanting to give absolutely everything you have to me, and I get it, and I take it, and I use it, and I'm very, very, very good, and I come away an entirely different person than I think to our chance. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Then the conversation was worth it, right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, thank you, Tom. Uh, but I think bef before we go, I just want to, um, as you were speaking, I was thinking about we make we make um, heaven and hell. I think is right here with us all the time, and we make our lives either a heaven or a hell. Um, so again, we decide. And I know it's not so easy, and I know it's, it sounds, but. If we take one step back, we realize maybe all we have is this moment and what are you doing at this moment? What are you feeling at this moment? And what are you thinking at this moment? And from there, we can decide where we want to go, right? So. I love Tolly totally saying that, that, you know, our, our nasty thoughts, it's like a train with a lot of momentum. As soon as you observe it, oh, there's all that negative. It doesn't mean you can you can actually stop it just by observing. You, you can, but 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 you you, it's wonderful to observe. You've, you've immediately started slowing it down. Yes, and I yes, think it's that's yes. ancestral stuff. I'm Irish and I tend to be negative a, a lot. You know, we're only happy when we're in hell. A, a lot of the negativity, when I see it and I can't just transmute it to joy immediately, you know, you know what's wrong with you? I was like, oh, it's no. okay. It, it's a big load, and it, it's, it's, I'm working on it. And as soon as you realize I'm working, not just on me, I'm, I'm working on my Irish heritage, I'm working on what I got from my dad and his dad, and, and that's big work, and it's heavy. And, that's, and maybe I need to just have a coffee and sleep and work on it more tomorrow. Yes. You know? <laughs> so the fact that can't immediately is okay, too. This stuff has gigantic momentum. Right? Yes, yes. And it's okay yes. if it's overwhelming. Of course, everyone has their own journey. That's the fun part. I mean, we, everyone has their own journey. Everyone has their own world, right? Um, yes. And then we just collide. Worlds, worlds. Yes. Which is pretty cool. Yes, 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 yes. Wow, thank you, Tom. This was a great conversation. We had an even better one before, which we should have recorded anyway. <laughs> And maybe we will next time. But thank you. Thank you so much um, for being here. Thank you for this conversation. It's always, I love these conversations because um, it goes like so deep wherever we go. So thank you. Thank you to everyone who's watching. If you have any comments or you, what about your opinion or what do you know? What do you think? Um, let us know. Let us know in the comments and let's have a conversation as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for everything. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, Tom, again. Many blessings. Thank you. Bye for now.